So we pretty much are a um, nationwide group of volunteers, and so we volunteer um, in our service positions, positions over a wide variety of different types of issues that affect um, America. Um, and we are, I'm part of Project Conserve, um, which is specifically focused towards environmental issues. But you find that there's other um, organizations and uh, uh, AmeriCorps -like programs that focus on other things like education, um, housing, poverty issues, um, health. And so we focus on a wide variety of topics that are important for uh, our country. Um, and then our like, role is to strengthen our communities, build them up, and uh, make them as great as we can during our service time. Project Conserve, which is my program, is based out of Western North Carolina, so we focus on our mountains um, and some of the foothills. And we're all conservation-based, so they're mostly conservation organizations, but they're um, also environmental advocacy groups and food groups promoting organic food, um, and just any ways to make a healthier environment and a more sustainable one at that. And so our topic today is on invasive species. Um, so we pretty much can categorize all species into three, which would be native, non-native, or non-native and invasive. Um, and so native species, they all have a specific place where they have originated from and they've grown up historically, they've evolved there. And over time, they have a specific role in that ecosystem. Um, so these, these type of plants um, are really good at filtering water. Um, if there's specific pollinators in that area, uh, they take on those roles well. Um, some, and they work together with each other so trees can hold in the soil. Um, and these plants all depend on each other in order uh, for the ecosystem to be balanced. Um, but I guess I'll start asking, so what can happen when a new species is introduced to a uh, new place? Displace others. Yep, it can displace others. Do we have any? It can bring in new diseases, mm -hmm. new pests that aren't necessarily disease, insects or... Um, yep, so like bring around disease and other uh, problems. Um, any other? Answers you want to throw? Won't have the food that they needed with the natural, with the native plants. Yes, yes. So they're not always the best to fill in the roles that they might take. Um, and so, when they become introduced, oftentimes the roles are negative, in some sort of way. But sometimes they're neutral or even like beneficial for us. Um, so here we just have like a very uh, like simple like comparison between non-native, native, and non-native invasive species. So with our native, um, our example here is the eastern hemlock tree. So it's one of our strong trees that um, has been around for quite some time. Um, it has been seeing some impact from non-native invasive species, but we can touch on that in a little bit. But this tree has a specific role in the ecosystem. So this thing filters water out very well and it's found along streams. Um, and like in the past, they grown to be quite large, um, and a lot of our forests are largely hemlock forest. And so we like those trees. They provide us a lot of uh, benefits and also the ecosystem benefits. One example of a non-native species that we have is corn. It's pretty nice to have though, because when it's in most of our foods, even though it's not originally from here, it grows here. Um, but you don't see it growing wild or all over the place. So pretty much we have to plant it and take care of it for it to grow, but you don't really see it growing out in the wild, taking over forests and fields. Um, and it doesn't like disrupt any other ecosystems other than the initial cut for where you want your, for or your farm. But the plant itself is pretty neutral and more of a benefit for all of us. So that's one example that we do like of non-natives. But then when they start causing problems, that's where we do not like these species. And so non-native invasive species, um, what makes, what's makes them invasive is that they cause negative impacts. 
It's not always on the ecosystem, but it could be uh, towards our economics, sometimes our health. Um, they can bring over disease, they can outcompete all our native species, and they can just bring over a lot more issues than we could have ever uh, perceived them happening. And also an important thing to note is that these aren't always intentional things that we're bringing over. Um, so like with corn, that's intentional, we want that. But with a lot of our uh, non-native invasive species, they were brought over by accident or they were brought over with, and they had some unintended consequences that uh, really um, did not do us well. And so why do we care? Um, so pretty much every day is a better day for invasive species. So it means if, um, so our population is growing every day and so um, there is a bigger need for development and also there's just more people to spread these plants around. Um, with that population growth, we also have increased international trade. So we can trade pretty easily with any countries in the world, boat, uh, truck, or plane. And it's not that hard for some seeds or some plants or to accidentally be like taken on or even on purpose because we have access to all these areas in the world and so people always want to bring a piece of their home to their new home and it doesn't always work out. Um, and then climate change is also promoting spread of invasives because it's just becoming easier for them to grow in a lot of places. Um, so we're seeing that uh, some plants can now go, go and travel farther north in our country, um, whereas like several years ago it was too cold for them to survive there and now it's like becoming more suitable uh, conditions for those types of plants to grow there. Um, so they also limit uh, productive land management. So when you have one type of plant or a few that are taking over a forest, you're not gonna get all the benefits from that uh, like natural and native species forest. So um, this could be affecting our water quality if the plants that are around the stream aren't doing so well. Um, it can also um, impact our trees and other crops that we want there if these plants are competing with them and having a negative effect on these uh, plants themselves. Um, and then also um, even just some ecological processes can be affected through that. Um, and then also another way that is like pretty significant um, is the biodiversity will decrease if we have too much of one plant. So we can see this often with kudzu, especially in our area, is that these vines will take over the forest and pretty much establish a monoculture and that dominant culture, a dominant cover um, of kudzu. And so we're not getting uh, as many native species underneath because there's not enough sunlight available and also they're taking up the actual space that they're growing in, their root systems are taking up space, and so our native species aren't doing as well. Our native species promote our native animals, um, and like insects, pollinators, um, birds, and all those, uh, everything in between. And so if there's only one food source and they don't eat that, they're not gonna be there. Um, and so they'll find somewhere else to live. Sometimes the invasives will even take down their habitat and just make it unsuitable for them to live there. Um, and so by getting rid of invasive species, we're promoting biodiversity, um, not just plant life, but animal life will follow that um, if we can get them away. Uh, ecological processes, um, so soil formation is one big one that's kind of interesting. When you have that dominant crop cover, um, your leaf litter becomes a different type of leaf that's uh, going to be decomposing to your soil. Um, so we have an example with kudzu. Um, if that establishes dominant cover, the leaf litter underneath will change because they won't have as many of those native leaves. And then the decomposition is different enough where the kudzu leaves, um, they, something with the decomposition process is a little different and our soil can no longer hold as much carbon storage as normal. So um, it makes it worse for um, just emitting carbon emissions. 
Um, one easy way for humans to see the impact is if the trail is not accessible because too many plants are growing into it, or um, if you're walking and there's always grass up to your knees, like it's not going to be favorable for us to walk on and enjoy. Um, and so it limits hiking. If biodiversity or diversity of animals is going away because there's too much of invasive, hunters aren't going to be able to want, want to use that land. Um, and bird watching, also birds follow um, like nice habitat. And if there's something that like, okay, if there's only this type of seed and I don't like that type of seed, uh, the birds will find a different place to go. They can move around pretty easily. Um, and then of course there's uh, certain ones that are poisonous to human and livestock depending on if it's eaten. Um, and then plant diseases can be transferred over easy, somewhat easily as well depending on the invasive species. And so here we got some pictures of um, some invasive species at work. So here's a familiar site. I don't know if the laser works too well on the TV screen, but you can see kudzu, it's all too familiar. Um, and you can just see how it forms these dense
that has all those uh, seeds, those orange and red ones that are quite noticeable. You could cut off the bottom and then just cut off the top seeds, so make sure that they're going away, the birds aren't going to get them. And you can put them right in a landfill because that's a good spot for a lot of these invasives. Um, you know, I think in this instance, we had this volunteer dig up a privet that had definitely been cut before, but uh, what we found it was growing in other places. So we had him, you know, he was really excited. He dug it out and got all of it. Um, and it was pretty satisfying work for him. But yeah, that was definitely, we had to check back on the initial treatment of that spot because um, yeah, it's been managed before, but it wasn't 100% that first time. Um, and if you look behind him, you'll see we have a pile that's mostly privet and multiflora rose that we're gonna, uh, at that instance, the town of Tryon would take that pile away and dispose of that for us, but we wouldn't leave that on site. Or if we do, um, we make sure the roots aren't touching the ground so that they'll dry out and decompose before. Um, so like either like hanging them up in trees or um, any other way to keep those roots away from the ground because we don't want them to have any chance to re-sprout. So here in well, Polk County, that's where I'm serving, most time not in uh, South Carolina, but um, we have several efforts going on uh, through Conserving Carolina and others to get rid of these invasive species. Um, so first I'll talk about the Kudzu Warriors. They're a great group of volunteers. We got some of them around us right now, which is real nice to have. Um, but they are, they're, this one, they're a group of uh, volunteers that started around eight years ago to get rid of kudzu in Norman Wilder Forest along 176. And uh, it's been been some time, but uh, over the years, it's been really effective of what's been accomplished there and almost serves as a model of like how uh, like to treat kudzu over the course of time and it's not just a one step problem, a one step fix. So um, yeah, I think about, I guess eight years ago, the first volunteers started coming out there and then every week uh, they're coming back, numbers are rising, sometimes, yeah, and uh, it's like a bunch of good people out there doing some good work and it's been some major changes. So um, once Wilder is back open, I encourage you to take a walk on the trails and like look at what's around you. You won't see much kudzu unless you're looking pretty hard. And then if you have a view from across the river, across the Pakalit, you can see something like when that image where every tree is covered with kudzu and you can't tell what's what. Um, so it's really cool to see that type of progress made, and that's, that was pretty much all manual eradication efforts. Um, and just like a lot of progress have been made there. Um, we also have invasive work going on other projects. So right next to IGA, we have the town to try on lot. We're there every week also. Uh, it was once where the goats were. Now we got people there because what we found with the goats was that you need them there for longer because if you keep them there for just a short time, um, they'll eat it. They won't eat the roots, but then also they're seed dispersers, so they're not really, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're not leaving there, so they'll eat it, and then the seeds will be right back where they got them from.
but definitely making a difference in their presence. And so individually, there's several things one can do to limit invasive species, get rid of them. Um, so first one's pretty easy. It's just don't plant recognized invasive plants. Um, it'd be better to go for all native, but that's not always going to be the options at the nursery. So we, under we uh, can understand it can be hard to get all these native plants, but at least try to avoid the invasive plants of that. Like we don't want more English ivy. Some people are doing bittersweet. Um, but yeah, so at least the invasive ones, we try not to like promote those at all. Um, on your own land, detect invasives early on because if you leave it one day, it's just going to be a bigger problem the next. And it becomes a serious problem if left untouched for several years. And then you look at when the plant's really small, it's like, oh, this was not that big of a deal at the beginning. Like, it would have been fine to uh, got rid of it then. It had been much less work, time, effort, money. Um, so just be like, uh, I don't know, mindful of what's growing on your land. 